Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Here, another fantastic Sunday. Um, whew, here we are, all of us real estate investors doing this all over again. So, as you guys know, if you're new to the show, Lumberjack Landlord here. Um, 51 buildings, 145 units, crushing it in real estate investment. And uh, the the class last night went for three hours and 15 minutes. I literally couldn't go to sleep after we finished. It was awesome. Absolutely awesome boot camp class. Thank you so much for all who participated. Um, amazing value brought by the group last night. Um, Chris Culp, who you'll see in the comments very often, brought an absolutely fantastic presentation for sub-metering. Yeah, I know. Sub-metering. Who'd have thunk? But it was awesome. Fantastic. It was great to go through. He did an amazing job taking us all through it. Um, if you're in the boot camp today, he's actually kind enough to basically spend some time with us again today talking about it. Um, so make sure you don't miss today's boot camp if you're signed up. And uh, we're excited for that. That's going to start at one o'clock today. Uh, on a second note, old guy REI right here. Right here. Very nice. Thank you very much, Frank and Cynthia, for sending me an amazing shirt. And it fits perfectly. I mean, it does kind of put the guns out, but that's all right. That's all right. My wife was like, ooh, I like that shirt on you. <laughs> I was like, okay. So thank you in advance, Frank and Cynthia. Um, but uh, yeah, so what I wanted to talk to you guys about today, uh, before we get into questions and good morning to you all, um, I really wanted to talk about, you know, what investment gives you the best return? I think the biggest challenge that I'm hearing so often is, you know, none of the deals that I have make sense, um, you know, uh, you know, looking at my portfolio and I'm trying to just add the next one, I'm trying to add the next one. Um and I, I'm not seeing anything there. Uh, but the funny thing is, is very often when they don't see something there in that three bed, two bed, two, three bed, two bath asset, you're giving up. Oh, don't give up. Don't give up. This is hard. This is hard. If you give up, you're just one of those trolls that comments on my channel that doesn't know what you're talking about. And then I have to shame you. That's no fun. Actually, it's kind of fun for me. Uh, if you guys saw the video last week with uh, Mike Zuber and with Dion, um, I talked about that. You know, one of the things is like Mike doesn't like to engage. And so he just says hi and then moves on. And for me, I just don't want stupid perpetuated. And so I feel like I have to engage you when people are acting dumb um, and not doing the right thing and not actually doing their research and, you know, thinking that it's another guru thing and all this other stuff. Right. They just don't know. Um, and they're certainly never going to take the time to walk the 22 years I've walked. Uh, but all that being said, one of the important things is as you're looking, I find, I'm finding too often people are just stagnant on a given asset, three beds, two baths. Or then they might get a little bit out of their comfort zone. They might go four bed, one bath or four bed, two bath. Guys, think broader. I still believe that investing close to you is far more valuable than investing remotely. There are typically better deals to be had close by than there are remotely if... If you've researched all of the different products in your market and none of them work, then by all means, now start looking at building a team. Now start looking at going to other markets, researching other markets. But the idea that you can't be in your market at all for a year, that's just insanity. It's no longer, you know, it's we, we no longer have the, the, the national crisis going on that we did. So people have to be getting into their areas. This is one of the ways, and there's a number of pretty famous YouTubers. One comes to mind in particular. It was an episode on Bigger Pockets. It was Spencer Cornelia, and he lost like 90,000 bucks investing remote. Guys, people will rip you off, especially when you give them a great chance to do so. People do what's inspected, not what's expected. So you need to be getting on the ground regularly. You need to be making sure that you're building this great team, that they actually have good documented updates. You know, are they taking pictures for you once a week when a project's happening? You need to see that your deals and projects are making progress. So that's why I encourage you first is look at the different assets in your market. Maybe it's a mobile home park that's going to work best, like the double wide queen. I love talking to Autumn. She's absolutely fantastic. We're going to have her back on the show again now that I'm retired and I've got some more time. So 
that's going to be an absolutely fantastic opportunity to, to further that discussion, talking more about double wides. You can be talking about duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes. They are all different in every market. What you're looking for is the value that you get. You're not taking a huge hit on a two bedroom or a three bedroom and a four and a fourplex versus a three bedroom and a duplex. You're not taking a huge hit on the cost or the rental price. So what is the value per door on a four unit versus a duplex? I can tell you that duplexes, duplexes that are done here sell for six to six fifty. Well, I can get a duplex, for, I can get a quadplex for under a million. Okay. Well, now we're talking. Now we're talking, but now you've got to get dialed in. Guys, the excuses are gone. I need 20% down to buy a triplex or a quadplex. The excuses are gone. That excuse doesn't exist anymore. Fannie and Freddie removed it for you. They gave you the biggest crutch in investing you could possibly get, which is getting a 5% loan, 5% conventional loan opportunity on a fourplex. When you go against and compete against guys like me, I have to put 25% down. 25%. You get to walk away at 5%. That's a massive difference. Here, if you're talking a million dollar quad, right? 5% is 50 grand. 25% is 250 grand. I have to have five times the cash that you do. Now, it all completely changes as well because in all likelihood, an owner awk, they're going to get the deal done. An investor can more easily walk away. So, if, as we look at all the different areas, really what investment is going to give you my best return? Have you done that homework yet in your market? Have you looked at it and said, okay, so singles are out. Dupes, maybe. Duplexes, maybe. Tries and quads? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, now let's try and find out in the city where there are tries and quads. All right. Well, there's not really that many tri tries and quads here. However, there are some. And some of them have been owned for 10 or 15 or 20 years. Now's the time. Now is the time to be getting in front of those people. Next thing is, does, does it maybe make sense to go commercials? It maybe makes sense to use multifamily strategy, like what Christian talks about. Possibly. That's very possible. Maybe it's something where you give up some of the equity in the deal, right? Some of, like, some of the things that they do to actually get big deals done where they don't have to come and bring a, a deposit to the table. That's a possibility as well. So I say all that to get to the easiest way to get a return. Did you think I wasn't going to give you the answer? Of course I'm going to give you the answer. So the best way to get your greatest return very often is by improving your asset. It's just simply by improving your asset. Get a day where you're spending, you know, a weekend out there with, uh, you know, a couple of hired hands and you're doing some nice landscaping. You know, maybe you're touching up paint on the building. Maybe you're adding shutters where you can look and search online and you can probably buy them pretty inexpensively. You know, as you're looking at um, other ways that you can add value to your assets <clears throat> or even heaven forbid, cut costs. You know, somebody actually, so in the course, one of the things that we actually teach is toilets. I know toilets, termites, and whatever the other third one is. Okay. To toilets, termites, and tenants. Yeah. Okay, well, you can make good money passively. See, I can't even say it. I stutter when I say passively. But you can make good money passively, but you can't make amazing money passively. You just can't. And it's because you're having to pay someone to manage and be the operator. There's a cut to that that exists. But as I look at a lot of my different assets, and as I manage, as I manage my buildings, one of the things I look at is something very simple, toilets. A lot of times in these older buildings, you'll find a 3.6 or a 3.8 gallon per flush toilet. And if you're in a higher density unit that might be three bedrooms or four bedrooms, you know, what you can literally do is you can see what's your cost per gallon of water, you know? And one of the things that I saw per gallon of water cost was four, four cents. That was a number I saw yesterday, four cents for a gallon of water. Okay. So somebody says, oh well, man, how many thousands of gallons do you need for it to make a difference? Not that many. Do the math. It was something like four cents. I want to say it was four cents. I mean 0.4 cents. Let's see, let's say it was 0.4 cents. Let's get nutty, right? 
But when you're looking at a when you're looking at a typical toilet and you figure you have uh, you know a three bedroom or a four bedroom, so you've got three or four people in there. Let's say it's four people in there. You get at least a couple of flushes a day. And when you're looking at it, you say, well, yeah, but so what, Matt? Like you're gonna save like two bucks in a day or a buck in a day. Okay, a buck a day, a buck a day. How much do you think that toilet costs? How much do you think the new the 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 new ring costs? Right. You can get the toilet that I recommend. You can go buy that toilet for three for less than 300 bucks. You can buy that toilet for less than 300 bucks plus a wax ring. There's a billion YouTube videos on how to change out a toilet. It is not hard. It really is not hard. Or you even pay a plumber to do it. So let's say you're 500 bucks or you're 415 bucks all in because you go pick up the toilet, you drop it off and all they're doing is showing up to basically pop the old one off and put the new one on. Again, not hard, not hard. It's less than it's, it's usually a 20 or 30 minute job, but the plumber's going to charge you a hundred bucks to show up. So let's just say you're in for 500 bucks all in and you say, yeah, but Matt, I just spent 500 bucks. Okay. You're going to get a buck a day back. Let's just get nuts. Let's say it's 50 cents a day. Let's keep on trimming the numbers to something just absurd. 50 cents a day, Matt, it's not worth it. It's 182 50 a year. That means in two years, that toilet's basically paid for itself if you decided to install it yourself. And that's if it's only 50 cents a day. And it's going to be more than that in all likelihood. When you cut from a 3.6 gallon to a 1.2, it's a third. It's a third. It's a third the amount of water per flush. Guys, there's three things that this strategy gets you. One is it gets you a great return on your investment. You're going to invest, let's say, 350 bucks. You know, but in that investment that you're going to have at 350 bucks at 50 cents a day, two years, that thing's paid off. Two years, that toilet's paid off. And you're like, yeah, but that's not that big of a deal. Really? Is water getting cheaper? Are your sewer bills getting cheaper? Or are they like a lot of cities that are saying, we can't raise taxes anymore. We own the water district. Let's raise that rate. Let's raise that water sewer rate. So that's what a lot of cities are doing. Do you know in the last five years in one of my cities, my water rate, my water sewer rates doubled? It's doubled. Something that used to cost me about 200 bucks a quarter now costs me 400 bucks a quarter. So if I'm spending 400 bucks a quarter on that for a given building, because I've got three toilets or let's say it's a triplex, I got three toilets. Again, making that less than thousand dollar investment. But then if you have a plumber there for an hour and a half, because you upgraded all your toilets, again, Focus on the overall impact this is going to make to your business. It's an off the charts impact because what does this do for you? Like we said, we talked about three things. One is it gives you an amazing return on your capital. Now, when you get bigger, are you going to go through the time to you know replace 30 toilets? No, I don't recommend that. You could, but I don't recommend it. Your better thing to do is, hey, we're biding time. We're waiting for the next investment. We're waiting for the next opportunity to purchase something great. So let's keep on doing little things here and there that constantly add to the balance sheet. What is that? That's called being a great operator. That's the purpose of my course. That's why I'm excited to always deliver my course to my boot camps. Certainly the students that are in there that watch recorded videos, there's massive value there. Absolutely. But if you want to go that next level, the boot camp is where we do it. We spent three hours last night. I don't go, oh, hey, we hit two hours or an hour and a half, and now let's jet. You know, we, we don't do that. So um, hold on. Uh, you're on a laptop mic. I'm not. I'm only on this mic. Bop, bop, bop. So hopefully that's coming in okay. Um, but thank you, Coster. <clears throat> I sound like I'm on a laptop mic. Here, I can probably get this closer then. Or it might be that I'm too close. I could just be too close to it. That's possible. So as we look at it, we've really got three areas. We've got one where it's what is my best investment? And that is almost always, it's going to be optimizing an existing asset. But that's after you've exhausted, okay, there's no other deals out there to be had and anything that I wanna be getting into. Well, don't sit stagnant. Start looking at fortifying your property, optimizing your property, looking at toilets and low flow shower heads and things like that. That's all stuff that we teach in the course, but we take you through all of those steps. But when you look at the toilet side of things, you could be talking on one toilet. You could be talking return on investment in two years. Um, 
is there anywhere that you're getting a 50% return on your money? I just love to, I, if there is, I'm wrong and let's do what you think. There isn't, there isn't, if there were, everyone would do it. Now it's limited, right? Because it's only based on the number of toilets, number of shower heads you have and things like that. However, this is the second bonus to taking this approach. The bank now sees you as a good operator. The bank now sees you as a good operator. They look at the numbers and you can, and then what I do is I actually call it out. I show it to them. When I give my bank my rent roll every year, because I give them my rent roll every year, when you have a relationship with a smaller bank, they're going to want that. They want to know who they're in business with. And that relationship is far better than my good buddies, Dion's wham, bam, thank you, man, give me the rate. I get it. A lot of people like to just get the lowest rate and that's what matters the most. To me, it just doesn't. I want to build a business. I want to make an impact on my community. I want to make an impact that is measurable. And that makes my life a whole lot easier. When I go to the town and ask for uh, you know, something to be done differently, when I go to the bank and ask for something to be done differently or to make a product with them, where do you think that comes from? That's not luck. I, I, the toilet that I recommend is the uh, Viper is the Viper two. That's the toilet that I recommend. The Viper two is the one I recommend. Yep. Viper two. You can look it up. You can Google it. Viper two. Yep. That's the toilet that I recommend. Oh, let me see. I'll, I might even be able to give you a part number, but the Viper two is the one that I recommend. And the reason for that is it's properly designed where I don't have to worry about clogs. They clog almost never. Um, but they clog a lot less often, but it's a Gerber. It's not a, it's not an American standard. It's a, it's a, a Gerber Viper too. And I'm not sure you can get that at Home Depot. You might need to call a local supply house. You know, in my, in our area, it's FW web, but you can get a cash account. If you have a trust, if you have an LLC, if you have any of those things, as you guys know, I don't put myself in LLCs, but I do have a trust and I can sign up with a trust with an EIN. That's simple. Or you can sign up for a business account. Sorry. These things are really annoying me. It, it's just, it's a thing. I got to get, I got to get a trim. It's been too long. But so if we're looking at, if we're looking at all those different items, right? So the first thing is, again, we'll cover it again. First thing is I've exhausted all my other options. There's really no other deals in the market. I need to start to optimize my assets. Toilets are a great place to start and look at the return that you're going to get on. Second thing is that shows the bank that you're actually an operator. Third thing is, it's not one of those things that is going to constantly be death by a thousand cuts. As they continue to raise the price of water, as they continue to raise the price of sewer in many of these communities, it's something that's going to continue to pay for itself over and over and over again. With the Viper, with the, and I don't, uh, Gerber is not a sponsor of my show, even though you should be. They're not a sponsor of my show, but that Gerber Viper 2 toilet is absolutely awesome. We never have issues with it. The, the, and, and so they don't endorse, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you what I use, but they're not an endorser of, of the show, um, or a sponsor of the show. <clears throat> so that toilet though, uh, we don't have clogs with that toilet. We don't get clogs with that toilet. How many times have you had a clogged toilet that you've had to either send a handyman out for, or go take care of yourself? How many times has that happened? And when it happens, how big of a mess is it? It can be a pretty big mess. It can be a pretty big mess. So that's why I strongly encourage you guys, if you look at those three things, right? I've looked at optimizing my, I've looked at buying another asset, but I can't buy another asset. So what is my next greatest investment return? It's going to be optimization. Second thing is, it then is an investment in yourself and in your asset because the bank then looks at you as an actual operator and that's what they really care about. And then the third thing is, as we just talked about, you guys really need to understand that what this does for you in your portfolio is it makes your portfolio future-proof. These are the things that people don't take the time to do. And that's where you're going to be seeing much better and bigger returns than all of your competition in the market because they don't take the time to optimize. They get it stabilized and that's good. And then they leave it behind. And then you start to get the, you know, the great uh, degradation of your asset optimize your properties. So with that being said, let's jump into the questions. Um, and that was good stuff right there. I, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I can do any better than that, but anyway, let's do this thing. Um, old guy, REI. Good morning. Good morning, Frank. 
What a coincidence. I had my shirt on and you were first in this chat. I appreciate you. Corby Carr and check out old REI guy on YouTube. Check them out. He's absolutely killing it with his tile projects and showing the packs and going into the mixing. Va- like he's crushing. It's good. Corby Carter. Good morning, Misfits. Good morning, Corby. Ha- uh, happy to see you here, my, my friend. Hope you're doing well. Uh, Richard. Great morning, Matt and everyone. Thank you. Buzztune. Good morning. Mike. Good morning, Mikey. It was great having you in boot camp last night. Last night, boot camp was a blast over three hours of fun. Kip. Good morning. Welcome to journey. Hey, Chester. Good morning. Brett. Good morning. Laura. Good morning. Jason. Jason. Good morning. Good to see you. Hey, Kim Bishop, you new investor. You, she's an investor in a deal in Gary, Indiana. Congratulations to you. Deconstructing dreams. Good morning, Matt. Rise and grind, bro. Listening while working on renovation for my parents. That's what I love. Oh my goodness. I tell you, I, I sadly, when I was first doing a lot of my, uh, work on properties, um, the option was, uh, we were, they had just, had they come out with the, I don't think I could afford the first, um, iPod, iPad, iPod, no iPod. I think I was still doing it with a CD player, CD player and earphones. So I listened to a lot of firehouse. <clears throat> Sadly, lead singer for firehouse CJ passed away this last week. Really sad news. Super talented musician. Um, yeah, I like hair metal bands. What do you want to say about that? Um, but he was awesome. Amazing voice, amazing artist. Sad to see him go. Um, but yeah, I listened to a lot of firehouse, uh, that year and, uh, who else? It's a lot of firehouse that year. I really liked firehouse. Uh, <clears throat> anywho, uh, Chris Culp. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Keith Hager. Good morning. Sam Farho. Good morning. Fire and ice. Good morning. Missed you in class last night, but I think hopefully you'll be there today. Um, Angel. Good morning. Senya, good morning. Angel, do you allow tenants in your duplex to use the attic and basement for storage? I've noticed they tend to accumulate a lot of clutter uh, when they have extra space. That's true. Um, So usually what, um, in many cases, I don't. In many cases, I don't. In some rare cases, I do. Um, The reason that I do in some rare cases is because that will actually help the tenants stick around longer. They'll start to accumulate stuff. They'll start to get stuff. They'll start to get stuff. People very, very rarely have a personality type that allows them to just get rid of something when they've stopped using it or allows them to do a yard sale every year to cleanse, to cleanse the area. So in some cases, I don't really, I'm not sure that I have a a method to the madness. Um, but I can tell you that I definitely, yeah, without a doubt, we, we, we definitely want them to have access to those areas in most cases. In some, we don't. Usually in the case that we don't, it's usually that it has something to do with the actual basement. The attic, no. I don't want anything up in the attic. Absolutely not. Because the other thing you have to make sure that they're aware of is if it's in the basement in New England, you have to make sure that they've got it up on pallets because it's going to get wet. The likelihood that you're going to get a flood in your basement at, you know, once a year, every, you know, couple times, every couple of years or whatever, likelihood's fairly high that that's going to happen. Uh, Robert Finelli. Hello, Matt. Great boot camp last night. Always love PhD level lectures with tons of data. Thank you very much, Robert. Yeah, it was awesome. It was so good. So good. I love those sessions. They're absolutely fantastic. Uh, what's great about it is that it's such a small group. You know, it's uh, we limit it to 15. I think last night we had 12, but we limit it to 15 where we won't go more than 15 because we want. I want to make sure that everyone gets to be a part of the dialogue. So it's it's really a good time. Um, Master Coach University, thank you very much for the five dollar super chat. What team and steps should we use when adding bedrooms? Structural engineers, plans drawn. Um, not necessarily. That's a great question, though. Um, so I'll answer that question, then I'll roll back up. So don't worry, you don't you don't get skipped. Um, what I can tell you about adding a bedroom is it really comes down to the flow. When you look at an appraiser. Uh, an appraisal, they will deduct for flow. They used to. I'm not sure if the newer ones do anymore, but I had an appraisal done maybe three years ago where they deducted and they were like, flow, this is all effed up. Okay. Well, Section 8 doesn't seem to care. They're thrilled. They're thrilled that I'll rent them the unit. Um, But what you want to look at is you want to look at flow. So I wouldn't recommend going anything less than a 10 by 10 room. At a 10 by 10, you can still get in there comfortably with a with a twin or a full bed. You still have, you know, um, a, a dresser. 
um, you know, or a bureau. Um, what you do at that point is you start to add amenities to that space. You put a coax cable hook up in the wall and you have an electrician come in and, you know, add an outlet to that wall. Um, as far as do you need, you don't usually need plans with most cities when you're just adding up, uh, you're putting up a fake wall. You likely will need to pull a permit, check your local laws. Um, I know for us in one city, I have to pull a permit on everything. In another city, I don't really have to unless it hits a certain dollar threshold. Um, but I would look at what you're looking for is the size of the rooms and what you can actually get out of the rooms. Um, I had I had one or conversion of a garage, you know, um, unattached. You know, we had an attached garage bay to one of the properties. We actually brought a unit from a four bedroom to a five bedroom. I'll actually be talking about that uh, in the next week or two. I'll be able to take you guys through it. Um, so yeah, don't need a structural engineer because the room is already existing and you're only adding a wall to it. Um, plans, not necessarily. You can get something like, uh, you can get something online that just allows you to basically uh, draw out uh, essentially what the measurements are. See exactly, see exactly what the measurements are. But yeah, I wouldn't, I just wouldn't recommend anything less than 10 by 10. Um, <clears throat> Angel R, I would lock the basement door, but the electrical main is in the basement. The main or their their actual panel, the panel that they need access to. Pilati, good morning. Good morning, sir. Wealth building journey, tenants, toilets, and termites. Yep. Which is funny because up here in the Northeast, we don't get termites. It's usually only tenants and toilets. Um, and without tenants, you don't have an occupied unit. So that's kind of out. So I have to worry about tenants and toilets. I mean, okay. It's the business. That's fine. Um, it's like being an investor and saying, I don't want to have to deal with the customer who's, uh, or the, the, the property. Like, of course, like, again, Josh Coster. Hey, how's it going? I'm on a laptop mic. Uh, I, I mean, hopefully the sound issue, whatever you were having is gone. I don't have a laptop in the room and I don't have a microphone. That's my only mic. Uh, Wealth Building Journey, uh, YouTube University exists for a reason. Yes, it does. And remember, that's per toilet. That's exactly right. That's not for upgrading three toilets in a house. That's per toilet. It's amazing to me. And this is just shows how few people are actual business operators. That's okay. Learn that from people that have done it before. I've operated many businesses. I look at running a business, like having a big, huge dashboard of all these knobs, levers, all of these things that you can do and pulleys, all this stuff that you can pull on and rearrange. And it's about dialing it in. It's not income. It's not re only revenue. It's revenue and expenses. Okay. What are the line items under expenses? You know, if it's something where you have shared heat, you can do stuff for that. If it's something where you have shared water or sewer, you can do something for that. It's going through the asset and actually optimizing it. When you optimize an asset like that, you actually get a massive return on your capital. If you guys couldn't tell, I actually have a guest with me. He's just off camera. He's over there. So you might hear an occasional exclaim. Um, what people need to understand is the phrase less drag. Absolutely. So wealth building journey. So Chester brings up something I talk about very often in my course, which is everything I do is to create less drag. So it's easier for me to get more units. It doesn't make it easier for me to acquire more units, but it does make it easier for me to manage more units. When people say to me, hey, how many units do you have? 10, 20? No, I got 145. They're like, how big's your team? One person. Just one. I mean, plus me. But just one. The idea is you reduce the amount of drag by addressing all of these things proactively the other thing that you see, excuse me, is you optimize the asset while you're doing this process. And as you optimize that asset, what's that mean? It's going to give you a bigger return. How do you think I get to 20% return so fast? That's how you do it. He's so funny. Can you guys hear him off camera? One sec. He gets so in it. He's awesome. Uh, Jason, 
Uh, what model toilet do you recommend? Because now I have four to change. <laughs> there you go. Um, I I do recommend the Gerber Viper 2 toilet. Yep, I recommend that toilet. And you're likely going to have to get it from a supply house. Brian, good morning. Good morning, Brian. Um, I don't recommend the kid at three. Angel, whose other channel are you watching? Whose other channel are you watching? I do not recommend the kid at three. Whose other channel are you watching? That just hurts for you not to know what toilet I recommend. <laughs> Alex Velos, good morning. Enrolled on the uh, enrolled in the ocean. I'm a landlord now. What? Quick question: Would you install a mini split or central air for a three bed one bath? I'm getting mixed feedback. I want to save money for tenant um, and and myself. I think myself maybe. Um, so Alex, tell me what market you're in because that is going to be what changes my answer. So if you tell me what market you're in, I can give you feedback. Um, Jason, should I join the course in the middle or wait till the start of the next one? Thank you. Entirely up to you. Um, so the way that we do it is we don't fine tune it like one course two or two, one class, two class stuff. What we do is we do allow you to come in like, let's say halfway and do classes six through 12. And then when the next course comes available, you get an invite for one through five. That way you get the full 12 classes because we talk about the module usually for a few minutes and then we talk about a bunch of other stuff. Um, but you'll still have access to all of the ones in that season that you attend. So it's up to you. We'd love to have you. Um, but yeah, it's entirely up to you what you, what you think you want to do. Um, I mean, obviously, like we've done four. I think we've done four classes so far or five. That was number, I think that was number five last night. I think it was number five. I have to double check, but I think that was number five last night. And so that means, and the funny thing is, is we're five weeks in and I think we've already done, uh, 12 hours, 11 and a half or 12 hours in the boot camp. It's a lot there. It's a lot there. Laura San San Diego. Um, I attended a workshop at home Depot of how to replace a toilet. Good for you. I wouldn't even lift the toilet, but I was able to direct the handyman on the proper way to install. As he said, he was trying a shortcut knowledge. Well done, Laura. That's exactly what I'm so concerned about. You guys are you one of the, so one of the things that I got a little bit apoplectic about was somebody was like, well, yeah, but you know how to do all that stuff. Well, I know how to do it now. I didn't come out of the womb knowing how to change a toilet. I didn't know how to insulate a wall. I didn't know how to make sure to check that a, that a, uh, you know, a, an outlet's grounded. I didn't know all that stuff. I didn't just, I, I had to figure it out. And you've got somebody fantastic like me who walks you through the different types of tools that he uses. I still have to do that video on the go bag. I knew I missed something this last week. Um, we've got, I've got like so many videos that I've got like not all the way done that I got to get out there. Some for the course and some for the, some for the show. Um, but yeah, I mean, she went to a Home Depot thing. Now here's the thing. That's great. It's good to get out. It's good to meet other people there. That's all good stuff. That's all good stuff. However, if you were in a pinch, you could still look it up on YouTube. You can still find something on YouTube that says, hey, here's how you change your toilet. Um, let's see. Yep. There's the toilet. Closer to Mike is sounding better. Okay, good. Thank you for the feedback, Josh. Appreciate that. Lean, good morning. Uh, I'm here. Need to reset my alarms. I know. What's going on over there, Hyder? You're on East Coast time. That's a problem. <clears throat> Wealth building journey. Lumberjack landlord. Matt. Can you double check the toilet reco I sent to Jason to make sure it's the right one? Yeah, sure. Um, Viper toilet. Yeah, I'm sure that's right. It's I see I see Gerber. Yeah, GWS two. Yeah, GWS two one five one two. Yep, that looks correct. If I click on it, I don't know what that's going to do to my stream, the live stream. Um, Robert Fernelli, you know what? Uh, I have a toilet in my natural property that will randomly leak and have a puddle of water overnight. Might as well change to a Viper if it costs 125 bucks to get my plumber out anyways. Exactly. And see, here's the things. These are why, right? This is why so many people look at their deals and they go, eh, you know, it's, it does all right. You know, it's, it's, it's good. No, it's stabilized. Like, oh, thank God we did it. We finished all the work there that we needed to do. There's all these other places. That's what the course teaches you. There's all these other places that you can look and unearth 10 bucks a month. 15 bucks a month, 25 bucks a month. I'm sorry. Are you making more than 300 bucks on a door? Okay. If I save you doing two or three little things, I save you 30 bucks. That's a 10% increase. 
That's a 10% increase in your profit, in your profit, you know? And then, yeah, you get, uh, you know, you can do the uh, uh, increase of rents and you can do the, um, you know, billing utilities separately and you can do all that stuff, but it's the sum of the parts. That's what makes the biggest difference. You know, how many games would, you know, the Celtics win if it were only Tatum and Brown on the floor? And I don't. I really didn't want to use a basketball reference, but it's probably one people know more. I'd prefer to use a hockey reference. <laughs> Lars Nielsen, good morning, sir. Angel R, I'm curious to what you know, uh, why you don't allow storage in the attic. What if one of those workable tall ceiling attics, should I lock the door? If it's the walkable tall ceiling outlets, the biggest concern that I have is that very often the state of the attic. Right. And what I mean by that is it can be just, um, you know, it can be just joists. Um, it can be joists, but then it has, you know, insulation blown in six inches past. Um, it can be a, a, really a number of things. When stuff gets put up there, a lot of times it just gets left up there. I don't want, I just really don't want access to the roof. You know, people walking up in the space and standing up too fast. You do know that they put roofing nails through the shingles, through the sheeting, through the, you know, through whatever uh, frame set, framing setup you have in your attic. People can get a nail in the head. Like literally lean up and go into the head and split their head open. Like, ugh, no. Uh, attic stairs. Attic stairs are rarely a good thing. They're rarely properly built and put together to actually be leveraged well. There's another example. So that's why basement, yeah, I'm okay with basement, uh, but not the attic. Um, Key, good morning, sir. Good to have you here. Dylan, hey, what's up, Dylan? I thought you might have overslept. Uh, cash flow, what's up, my friend? Luke Devine, there he is. Hey, Luke, how's it going? Um, he simply wants to say hi. Uh, Los Angeles, California. So with the weather that you have in L.A., I would assume you can probably get away with mini splits. Mini splits aren't an amazing opportunity. The The challenge that you have there is, is I, I believe your electricity is really expensive. I don't know how the utilities, you know, work out there, but I would get quotes for both. I would get quotes for mini split system as well as uh, a traditional ducted system. If you already have the ducts, the, the ducts, that are existing, it might, it might not be the worst thing to go with that, that sort of a system. The mini split craze is something I don't really like. I really don't like it. A lot of people up in the Northeast, they put mini splits in, guess what? They were horrible in the week that it was absolutely freezing. A lot of them had to bring space heaters in. That's because the older homes aren't built with the type of insulation that the newer ones are. So it's, a, it makes a difference. Ah, so another super chat. Let me just roll down. Hey, Buzz Dune, thanks so much for the super sticker. Buzz Dune, always ask a question with a super chat. I, I don't mind. Uh, Master Coach University, where do you find your handyman? They seem to be the most needed common service call. How do you vet them prior to or after the first, second job? <clears throat> Great question. Great question. Um, it's just like anything else. How did I find my best employees? They originally started for me as handyman. They did. They did. Sometimes handyman love having control of their own day and I only do what I want to do. But then they're walking the fine line of, do I have enough clients? Do I not have enough clients? How do I build my clientele? You know, what happens when the economy shifts, that sort of stuff. Um, so I find them very often. I'll find them on, uh, on an Angie's list. I don't think thumbtacks is big here. I know that Dion talks about thumbtack. Um, but I'll also see other guys on, you know, other guys on crews and things like that. Um, you know, we'll look somebody up for X, Y, Z of an issue. We'll look up for handyman. We'll look up for somebody that's skilled at that specific thing. We ask them, Hey, what else are you good at? And so long as we're happy with the work and so long as we're happy with the price, we keep on calling them. A lot of times handymen get lazy and they're just like, dude, that's not even a good job. Like that job sucks. That job's not good. Job's not good. You know, and truth be told, a lot of people that have handymen do everything, 
they would tell you that there's things that they wish they hadn't let them do. So what you do is you find out what they're good at and you find out what they're not good at. And then you have other guys that fill in the blanks. A lot of times you'll find that the most expensive guy is almost always the most reliable. And so when you really have to get something done and the other guys are kind of like, duh, duh. like we have, we have multiple electricians. We have one, two, three, four. We have five electricians that we use right now. We had one for 10 years. It was awesome. We had another one for uh, five, six years and it was awesome. And then at the end, it wasn't awesome. He stopped showing up on time. He for, kept on forgetting. He wouldn't go back. He wouldn't go back and fix stuff. So it was just like, okay, pass. Bye. Bye. We'll wait and see what happens. I know he'll be back because he'll get stiffed on some job. Guaranteed. When the economy shifts, they need that maintenance level type of stuff, not the always, hey, I'm running new service. That's often what it is. So, yeah, so I look at Angie's List, Thumbtack, um, landlord groups. <clears throat> landlord groups that I'm hanging out in, I talk to them. Hey, when was the last time you had blah, blah, blah done? Oh, yeah, I had somebody do that with me six months ago, a year ago. Cool. Did you did, did they do the work? You like them? Yep, they were good. I liked them. Okay, cool. We'll use them. We'll use them. Um, let's see. Um, oh, here we go. Thank you, Matt. What is a pick? What is the pickup truck Dion is always teasing you about that just won't quit? So I have two, and whatever, Dion. Um, I have a 06... A GMC Yukon. That's my truck. Or that's my SUV. That's where I take my. That's where I take my kids in. But it's an 06. It has a couple hundred thousand miles on it. It's awesome. And I have a 2001 2500 HD Crew Cab uh, GMC. Nobody should make fun of that truck. It's going to last longer than anything made in the last ten years. <clears throat> that thing is bulletproof. And I got the big. I have a big block in it. I've got an 8.1 liter motor, 496 cubic inch. It's awesome. Love that truck. That truck and I and I put in uh, better uh, better leaf springs in the rear end, so it's got a one ton rear. <laughs> Sorry, can't say that out loud. That's awesome. Uh, Dylan McMahon, what's a delinquency report? Depends on how you're uh, what you're referring to. So we have a delinquency report, which is um, the tenants that are late on rent. We'll call it. We can call that a delinquency report. So it depends on how it's being used. That could be it. Luke Devine, Hyder. I thought you were starting to dislike me. No, Hyder doesn't dislike anybody except for sheep. He hates sheep. Buzztoon, the slow and steady message really hit for really hit home for me. Uh, Chris's PowerPoint was great. Pictures, explanation, answered questions after. Thank you. Yeah, Chris did an amazing job. Like I knew he would. Um, but it's all those things, right? You get you you become an expert after doing this for 10 or 12 years and learning new things along the way. We used to buy hollow core doors. Then I had to consistently replace them and now I buy solid core doors. So now if you're going to try and punch a hole in the door, your hand's going to get broken or a finger gets broken. And I love that about my hard, my solid core doors. If you're punching my door with that level of fury, I hope you do break your hand. <clears throat> Uh, Dylan McMahon, I've heard two opinions, one to have all properties in one area for market control and another to spread properties out 10 miles apart. What do you think is better if possible? Um, I think that, um, I, I don't, I, 10 miles isn't that much. It just isn't. It usually doesn't put you in that much of a hub or center. I know Dion talks a little bit about his distancing, I'm, I'm truly not worried about distancing. Your better bet is within your tenant pool being diversified. Because in my area, I have hundreds of thousands of jobs that are out there. So what I don't want is I don't want to get like construction heavy, right? I wouldn't want that to happen. I wouldn't want to have all of my people working. For example, there was a landlord around here that had all of their tenants that worked at Liberty Mutual. That was a little bit of a problem. Liberty Mutual decided to close down that office. It was a massive office too. It was a corporate headquarters. It was like 3,000 people. It didn't really impact our area though because where did they move? They moved 15 minutes, not miles, 15 minutes away. So people now commute to that office. 
Uh, and some of them were dispersed and some people are still there. But now guess what? That building is not going to remain vacant forever. People are going to go into that building. And when they do go into that building, then that's going to be a new tenant pool. So as you look at that, I'm I'm not concerned. That's not the reason I blew up in 08 and why things got so difficult was because all of my tenants were construction workers or had to do with the construction industry. All of them did. That's what crushed me because I went from eight paying to three paying to one paying. And that was a problem because then I'm having to make up for seven rents. So I don't, I don't subscribe to the idea that you need to have stuff a half hour apart. Well, then if that's the case, you're probably better off investing in another market that gives you a far greater return. Cause I invest my furthest property from furthest from basically end to end. You're talking about 30 minutes total, you know? Um, so yeah, I, I like that model. Efficiency. It's efficiency. It's very, very, very efficient. And in 08, that cost me, that didn't, that wasn't what cost me. What cost me was having them all in the same. And so that's why I'm very disciplined in how I diversify my portfolio. You know, <clears throat> how my portfolio is diversified is I've got retirees. I've got section eight. I've got students. I've got, um, uh, section eight students, retirees. Um, I've got young professionals. Um, we've got some families, um, and we have some shipyard workers, right? So we have a shipyard close to us. So that's six different, uh, verticals that basically don't really apply to any of it. They really don't. Um, and so that's what really helps. That's what really helps us. All nighter. A handyman should never say, I'm trying a shortcut. Yeah, <laughs> those are pretty disaster words. True story. Uh, I meant I could not lift it because it was too heavy to, for me to lift. Yes, Laura, that certainly makes sense. So, one of the things, Laura, that I actually like is there's a green foam. Um, and it's not really foam because it does have like a finish on it, but I have a, there's a green uh, uh, toilet donut. Um, and the cadets are lighter. And I'm pretty sure they're two piece. I have to double check. I think they're, are they still the two piece? So the reason why I like the green ones is when you drop a toilet on a wax ring, it's in, it's critical that you have an appropriate drop on that ring that you get the, you get the posts or the screws coming up through uh, or the bolts coming up through that you can then twist down on um, and get that thing brought down to the floor. But if you use this green thing, it's very forgiving. Um, I forget what the green thing is called. I don't remember the name of it, but um, it's like the Sani Seal or something like that. I think it's called. Um, but we use those because when you get the toilet down on that, you can actually move the thing, and it's not gonna it's not gonna hurt you. Because then once you finally get it into place, then you can screw it down. But I believe the Viper too. I'd have to double check. At one point, the toilet that we were using was two piece. I'm pretty sure the Viper two is two piece which means that the top bowl doesn't come attached to the bottom section. So because of that, and even on the old one, on the old one, you have to drag out the water. Cause if you remember a lot of those holding tanks are five gallons. If you got a five gallon holding tank, it's eight pounds per gallon. That's 40 pounds plus the weight of the porcelain toilet. So if you're having trouble, if you really want to do it yourself, Laura, if you're having trouble getting a toilet out very often, that back tank, you drain the water out first. So basically, here's taking a toilet out in less than two minutes. Explaining it, not physically. So first thing you do, you shut the water off right there at the toilet. So there's a little spigot that comes out the wall. You shut that off right there. Then what you do is there's typically then a, a, a plastic nut that is actually on the tank. Don't take that off yet. The first thing you have to do is take all the water out of that tank. And you can get it out with a, you know, with a cup. That's clean water. It's not dirty water. It's not going to make you dirty or yucky. So you can go in there. You can scoop it all out with water. Just dump it down the shower or the sink. Either one, your choice. When that thing gets down low enough, you can take some paper towel, just drop it in the bottom. That'll soak it all up. That we won't get any drips on the floor. Then you undo that plastic nut. When you've undone that plastic nut, now you've actually got the bowl where it's technically free from any encumbrances. Then you've got this big bowl on the top or essentially the, the water tank that's sitting there in the back. There's usually two bolts that come down from that water tank, but usually that's sat in place. 
you look at you look for those two bolts and you actually undo those bolts and then you can actually take that thing off and that's instantly going to drop the weight of your toilet in half you take that tank off you move it somewhere else and now you've got left just with the lower bowl when you're left just with the lower bowl you're going to see that there's two studs that are coming up to the floor they're usually covered by plastic caps you take those plastic caps off and then you use your wrench and you unscrew both of those. What I do is that I like to put a black plastic bag, a three mil plastic bag on the floor. I pop my toilet, I drop it on that plastic bag, and then I'm left with, boom, there's my space where my new toilet's going to go. The, the last thing that I do before I start the put back operation is I make sure to get in there with something with some sort of an edge, but I have plastic on that edge and I scrape off the rest of the wax ring. This stuff's disgusting. And it sticks to everything. It sticks to everything. So plastic gloves first. Then I've got plastic over my flat edged, whatever it is. I'm scraping that off. And then when I'm done with that and I have all that stuff off, then it's something as simple as I take my, my plastic off of the straight edge and I drop that in the trash. It's just that simple. So there you go. In about three minutes, I just described to you how you take an entire toilet off. Now, what did you do to put it back on? Now you've cleaned out that wax ring area. The next thing that you do is you're actually putting down that uh, green donut. You're making sure that the, you get new studs coming up through, that you have the set of nuts ready to go on those studs that are coming up through the floor or up through your flange. It's what's called your flange, that plastic thing that's actually you're going to attach to. That Those pieces are coming up through. You're then able to get your new toilet fitted and sitted and make sure that it's all sitting there and not, not wobbly. So you want to get it right down, make sure it's sitting there, make sure it's not too what's called proud that it's not sticking up too much you can see underneath it but you get that thing down then you get your nuts you screw those things down onto those posts that are coming up they then will give you a pair of pliers you can usually snap off the extensions of those nuts um, or you can cut them off with a hacksaw or something like that and then you're ready to put your uh your bowl back on you attach your bowl make sure it's connected and then you what i do first typically is i take you know a little bit of water instead of filling it up I'll take a little bit of water, put it in there after I've reconnected the, the, the plastic nut. Then I'm looking at it and I say, you know what? I think we're in good shape. I'm not seeing that leak at all. I'm also going to go and when I'm doing that plastic nut on the toilet, I'm going to put Teflon tape on that thing too. That's just the way that I am. Sorry. Some people like that. Some people don't. I personally, I like it. So I put a little Teflon tape on that thing. Screw that thing back. You know, have that thing on. I've tested it. Now the thing I know holds water. Now I'm ready to fill up that tank. And I don't have to fill it up with the sink now because now I can just literally turn on the shutoff that was right there coming out of the wall. That thing then fills up. You put the cover back on. You give it an old, good old-fashioned flush. You look to make sure you're not leaking out of anywhere. The areas that you're going to be leaking are it's going to be either leaking from the bottom of the uh, of, you know, of the uh, the back of the toilet where you actually attach that plastic thing. It'll either leak there or it could potentially um, leak out of the where the actual tank is attached to the toilet could leak out of there where you have your two studs that come up there because those are usually rubber gaskets. So it could leak out of there. And it also could potentially leak around the floor for some reason you caught a lip on the gasket. So there you go. That's an install of a toilet start to finish. I know, I'm sure you got the sensation that I haven't done this before. But if you do it that way, I think you'll find yourself with a high level of success. Um... Alex Veloz, thanks for advice. Unfortunately, I have no ducks. That's okay. If you have no ducks, that's actually an okay thing. That makes you more of a candidate for the mini split option. In California, you're going to have less issues than you are going to have um, you know, with than you would up here in the Northeast with how bad our winters get. So I think mini splits are a viable option in those types of climates. Um, when you say California, hopefully you meant like Southern California. That should usually make it easier. But let me know if that helps. Certainly roll it, roll back into the questions if you've got one. Uh, give me just one second. Did I miss another? Oh, old REI guy. Uh, thanks for watching our stuff. If you or anyone else knows a better and more efficient way to do it, I may be old, but not too old to learn. There is no efficient way to do this unless you've involved AI. It's a long, arduous task. That's why I only do my lives on Sundays. And if something really needs to be needed, like some something that I need to you know bring to you guys because it's something I just found that I think is a big issue, then I'll break it out and I'll do the quick video, but I just post it. But we don't spend a lot of time on the YouTube machine because I am not a YouTuber. I'm a businessman that does YouTube. Um, 
So thanks, Frank. Appreciate the super chat. And I, I, I do love your stuff. Um, you're better at a lot of that stuff than I am. So for me, it's it's fun to watch somebody who's better at it. Um, and, uh, and I don't know about you, but I think I think uh, Frank just has the perfect like ASMR voice. It's just so calm and soothing. Me, I'm like all wound up and you can tell all the time. Um, yeah. High energy, as they say. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Um, those two things. Hider. Uh, we covered the handyman thing. Uh, Dennis Dirty Deeds Doherty. I like the name, Dennis. Uh, has anyone ever tried seller financing with family members? Uh, I worry about mixing family and money, but I do have a great relationship with the person. Any issues that you've run into or think about? I don't think there should be any issues because they're really straightforward, right? Like the one extra step that I might take is I might take a document where you come up with 30 different scenarios or 20 different scenarios of crazy things that could happen. And then you get on the same page with what those are. And then you both just sign that document. I think that could help you because sometimes it comes down to interpretation. Um, that's really uh, largely what attorneys are around for is interpretation of the law and how it's then applied. Um, so I think if you wanted to take, I don't, I wouldn't say no, absolutely not. I would just say, if you do it, make sure you get that crazy 20 ideas out on, t on paper. Hey, if there's a blah, blah, blah moon, and this is what happens. And then, you know, you think you're not responsible for it. And I think you are, this is what our remedy for that is. If you have a document like that, you are going to be in a much better position than having to hire some sort of an arbitrator or an attorney, each of you to then get through it. Cause I can promise you the littlest of things is 5,000 bucks. I haven't thought of an acronym yet, but basically when it's like, when it's a boat, bust out another thousand. Afford, fix or repair daily. Um, attorney, somebody's got to come up with something for that, but it's like, but whatever it is, it's 5,000 bucks because that's largely what it costs to do even the small stuff. Super into his game. I see you. <laughs> Um, looking forward to the go bag video. Yes, me too. We just, we, we added a couple of things to it. Um, but yeah, it, there's a bunch of stuff in the go bag. Dylan, uh, would you invest in a hundred year flood zone? Got interesting, got interesting 23 unit full gut rehab could make at least 500 K. My idea is to leave. My idea is to leave. So value add potential to sell it to the next person. Make some money, but not own it. Um, I don't know that I, the biggest thing that you're asking there is something where you need to understand the flood insurance, because one of the one of the main pieces to a PNS is that the house is insurable, and a hundred year floodplain. I know it's insurable, but at what price? Like the other guy could be selling it. Because it's in the 100 year floodplain, he didn't get quotes from other vendors and insurance tripled, or insurance for everybody could have tripled. So, the biggest thing is doing that research. So, long term in a flood zone, eh, again, the key is understanding what that means from an insurance perspective because the rest of it doesn't matter. Um, I've taken a few nails of the head, so no lie there. Yeah, thank you, Johnny Cashflow. This is what I'm talking about. People sometimes giggle when they say when I say things like that. And I'm like, I have done it myself, and I know tenants that have done it. And I'm like, why were you up there? Like, well, we just wanted to use the space. I never said you could use the space. That gets me out. Matt, we're having mini splits installed in two units in our tri in Missouri. Uh, there are existing wall furnaces. Okay. Wall furnaces. Okay. To be used as backup for the extremely cold few days that the minis won't be affected. So wall furnaces. Awesome. Love them. We have some of those up here, but a wall furnace different than a mini split because the wall furnace, um, the ones that I use, they'll run off of gas. So the idea is in those cold areas, we can get those really bad cold snaps or we can get, you know, minus that aren't used to freezing temps and they get it for a week and a half and then stuff starts freezing up. The mini splits largely don't keep up. They can keep up with, you know, 20 and 30 degree weather. They can't keep up with single digit weather. They can't. So I agree with Frank. If you already have something that's there and existing, 
I would probably have it there in place as a backup, but otherwise, yeah. in those warmer client climates. Yeah. I think, you know, largely speaking, mini splits, that's what mini splits were created for. So yeah, great input, Frank. Thank you. Um, Flavio. Good morning, sir. Um, Oh, thank you. At next tenant turnover, I'm locking the attic. I would. Yeah, I just don't like the whole thing too, though, is is that a lot of times when you get a pest problem, like squirrels and things like that, they're attic based. Flying squirrels, they're attic based. They can chew stuff, they can eat stuff, and then all of a sudden you find out, oh, that was my great grandmother's that she brought over on the Mayflower. Like, okay. And then they want to like give you some big bill for something that was in the attic in some cardboard box. The other thing too is roof leak. That happens, gets whatever of their stuff up there wet. You aren't liable, right? Because they're supposed to have renter's insurance, but how many people actually have renter's insurance? And then they're still going to complain to you that it happened. Well, I didn't know it was a bad roof. I Like I did. So it just opens up doors. That's all. Um, Fire and ice. Several customers with competitors demanded they take out the heat pumps and put back boilers and furnaces. It's true. Yeah. I'm fire and ice. I think you're in New York, right? And that's true. In colder climates, that happens. In colder climates, they're like, oh, yeah, I believed in the mini split idea, and then it didn't work out very well. It does matter. What you do want to always look to get is the cold temp mini splits. The reason you want the cold temp mini splits is because they are actually built slightly differently, and they will actually they can actually handle the colder temps. Not long term, but they can handle the colder temps, at least for the time being. So look for something. Uh, again, that's that's a decent way to protect yourself. Uh, it, it, it certainly can help. Uh, let's see. Dylan McMahon, the property is right next to the area with the lowest rent, 1400 But like seven miles the other direction, rents are 750 to 1400 If I rehab it, it'll be brand new, having trouble figuring out what rents I can expect. Um, rent box. That's what we talk about all the time. And in my course is we're talking about the rent box. You have to look at what your, what stuff is on the market right now, and then tracking it for a few weeks, seeing what, seeing what rented and what it rented for. Um, could you explain how twoplex, fourplex aren't based on income? Makes no sense to me somehow, because that's how appraisals are done. Appraisals are done on residential units and they use the comp model. Commercial units use the rents and income model. So that's the difference. That's what that's what society has chosen. Um, and so, yeah, for singles, d- dupes, f- for single family, duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, those are all comp driven. They might on some of the on some of the multifamilies, they might use also, or they might take into account partially a a, a cash flow approach. However, largely speaking, they won't. songbird of his generation i don't normally try and steal his joy but he's just playing a video game um because mom's at the doctor's yeah sunday fun day sunday fun day with some one of the kids has a looks like i have an ear infection um i'd wonder how hard it is to maintain those mini splits it's not hugely hard to maintain the mini splits um and the reason why you know, the reason why it's not hard to maintain them is they do have a filter and you do need to clean them. Um, but they're electric. They're electric. So, you know, as far as maintenance goes, they might tell you, oh, yeah, you need a service contract, blah, blah, blah. If you just clean out the filters, you're fine. You, largely speaking. Um, that's been my experience. And that that hasn't that that hasn't uh, hasn't hurt me yet. Uh Dylan, if you're looking at a market to invest in, what would you consider good jobs in for the area? Um, example, is it just Walmart? They're good. No, I wouldn't say Walmart is good. Walmart's not good. Walmart's not a good job. Um, I would say like uh, Amazon distribution centers. Um, look at what the businesses are. Look at what the average wage is in the area. You know, for me, I honestly don't spend a lot of time there. That's not where I, that's not how I figure out my markets. I figure out my markets on what is the vacancy rate? And then based on the vacancy rate, okay, now what are the top 10 employers in the area? And if you find that 40% of your employees or 50% of your employees in the area are working at one company, that's not one that I love. Why? Because if they lay off, you know, 
10% or 20% and they're now 30%, there's going to be way more vacant. There's going to be way more jobs that are, uh, that are not available in the market. Then that shrinks that economy. So what I'm looking for is balance. I think far too often people get wrapped around the demographic thing. It's not that it's not that stuff can change. Look at the politics of States, right? We had a bunch of the, a bunch of people from Massachusetts move into my amazing state of New Hampshire. We had massive population explosion. And what the number one reason was they didn't like how um, that state handled the whole, uh, you know, a uh, health situation in the, in the early 2020s. So they all moved into my state and now our politics are changing and getting more dumb, like the Southern state, like the one below us, which is just stupid. We don't want those politics here. There's a reason why we haven't voted that way for a couple hundred years. So yeah, uh, -uh. we like low program. We like being a low program state because it keeps our taxes reasonable for all the workers. That's how it works. So yeah, I don't spend any time, any time evaluating demographic pushes, demographic trends. Don't care. Don't care. I care about vacancy and I care about the employers in those areas. That's what I care about. Um, yes, Chester. Thank you. Oh, and congratulations on your first super chat, Alex. I appreciate that. Hopefully my information was helpful. If not, please put it down below and I'll add more. Uh, all nighter. Yeah. One, ha a one ton rear end had a lot of potential to be expanded on. <laughs> exactly. How do you with me? Uh, Dylan, uh, if an area has one duplex and all single family, how do you determine price you pay? Uh, rent box, absolutely rent box every single time. It's nice that it's in an area of a bunch of single family homes, but again, not a precursor to what I purchase. I'm purchasing an asset that gives me a financial performance. If I'm purchasing the ugliest house in the neighborhood, awesome. If I'm purchasing the nicest house in the neighborhood, less awesome. So yeah, it really comes down to managing. It really comes down to learning what a great deal is and understanding the market. Um, one of the things that's useful generally be a lifelong learner. I agree. Invest to wealth. Hello. Good to see you. Luke, uh, is there any specific app you use to track the property's income expenses? Is Excel what you use? No, I use Excel for a long time, but now I use Dorloop. Dorloop is the product that I use uh, loyally. Um, and um, we're, we're getting ready to release some stuff in our course, which is uh, videos for our tenants that we actually share with them. Hey, here's how you file a ticket. Here's how you set up for auto pay. Um, here's how you pay an invoice if we invoice you online. Um, all of the data is there. Here's our emergency phone number. All of that stuff is in there in the system, um, which is awesome. It's just awesome. And so um, there is a diet version of that for smaller landlords. Um, I was on them a lot because it only used to make sense if you had 100 units. Now, if you've got 10 to 20, it makes sense. It's a little bit more expensive than some of the other ones out there, but you get enterprise functionality. And more importantly, it just allows you to better manage your assets. So that's what I do. Um, Laura Mar. I don't know what that. I don't know what that means. Hmm. Uh, fire and ice. We don't allow access to basement or attic. Yep, we put individual panels in each unit. Yes, but that's because you are in section eight. Fire and ice. I know that rule. So that's the other thing too. Is it very often in section eight? They they now very often in most in many states, not most. In many states, they require that the panel be in the unit and accessible to the tenant. So we actually, when we redo place, we put the panel in the unit. Um, uh, we avoid potential hoarding situation and it's safer. Totally agree. Uh, Dylan McMahon, how do you generally screen people you work with? Um, we check up on the work that they do. Yep. Yep. We check up on the work that, they, that we do. Um, we don't... Uh, we want to know the person, you know, we've had people that have, you know, served time and they were great workers. They made a mistake and they were great workers. So yeah, we've kind of done all that stuff. Uh, DM talk financial freedom. Every time somebody hits the like button, someone retires before millennial Mike. <laughs> I think we need to start a, uh, start a pink Panther campaign for Mike. Uh, all nighter reusable toilet seats, uh, seals are pretty good. Yep. Wax rings are one time use, uh, one time use steel. Yep. 
Make sure to plunge the bowl and get rid of uh, the bit of water. Yep. So it doesn't spill when pulling the toilet. Yes, absolutely. Yep. 1000%. Usually they make like this camping product and it's worth having if you ever have a problem where literally you can pull it, it suctions up. You put this plastic tube in, it suctions up. That gets all the water that's going to be in your toilet tube. And then that makes it a, a, a error free job. Uh, Dylan, how, how, uh, how much would you underwrite for per unit for a full gut and maybe redoing framing? It's geographically, it's, it's geographically focused. Um, what you pay for sheetrock in New York versus sheetrock in Seattle versus a sheetrock job in Texas, completely different. There's no shortcut to that. That's where you have to do the work and you have to actually reach out to companies and ask them, you know, and that's one of the things we teach in the course is how to work with contractors and how to work with code enforcement to understand that you're not getting ripped off in a quote, being able to walk through the quote and have them walk you through it. That's, that's one of the biggest keys for sure. Um, hit the like button. Thanks guys. Um, did I miss Martin's properties? There we go. Heading to the dump. Enjoy the trip to the dump. Major yard cleanup. That's awesome. It's a good time. Look at those landlords getting all landlordy. Uh, I hate pulling old toilets. You and me both. You and me both. Hugging piss and shit is not my idea of fun. True story. I'll wait till it's the last thing of the day so I can shower up ASAP. True story. But the other thing too is, this is something I forgot in my explanation. The other thing you can do is you can actually grab that thing. You can, you can grab the, um, when you've taken that top bowl off, you can then take another black trash bag, the three mil bags, and you can actually put it over the top of it because you know you have handles. You know, there's a place usually where the, bowl transitions to the back that's usually where you're able to grab that thing but when you put the black bag over it boom you're done you just get the black and all you have to do is then just lift up and you slide over the floor and you put it on the old other old bag then you don't have to worry about the, the piss and the shit i've done far too many toilets yes uh hey mark shero good to see you aloha from hawaii good to have you here laura san man diego matt i got the green donut the handyman showed up without one Matt, you are explained better than that HD guy. <laughs> I'm glad. Uh, you are amazing. Thanks so much. You're very welcome. I'm glad that that was helpful. Um, let's see. Good morning, Dennis. Um, would it make sense to put the put in the lease the areas that are designated for storage space? So what we do is is we specifically will say uh, we will we won't give them access. You know, so we're leasing them that unit. And that's why basement access, we put panels in units. That way we don't have to worry about that stuff. <laughs> uh, attic storage is not safe. Look what happened to Clark Griswold. Exactly. So that's what I was talking about with the joists. Usually a lot of times it's joists up there and maybe it's one or two pieces of plywood. You can have a foot go through a ceiling. Had that happen before. No joke. They were like, oh, we're not really sure to tell you this. And I was like, well, then just spit it out. And they're like, I kind of put my foot through the ceiling. Uh, what? We, yeah, we went up into the attic. What were you doing in the attic? Um, oh, okay. So I had to take care of it. Um, avoid the single points of failure. Exactly, Hyder. Luke Devine, is 7% vacancy in a 100K population area a lot to you? Yes, it is. That's a lot. That's high. 7% is high. Yep, that's not good. New Hampshire, New Hampshire is, um, New Hampshire is one person, just over 1%. Tight market. I don't, it doesn't bother me, right? 7% <clears throat> is high. What you do have to do is you do have to drill down more into the numbers. So Gary, Indiana, as an example, what are they counting as a vacancy rate, right? They have 30,000 houses, 10,000 of them should be bulldozed. 10,000 of them are lived in and 10,000 of them are in horrible disrepair and not really occupiable. Right. So then that's where you have to look at some of those numbers. I'm just telling him he's being super loud. Um, but yeah, 7% is high. Uh, Dylan McMahon. Uh, in an area, is, uh, if an area is one to two hours from major MSA 5K population, but 
two plus percent population growth. Major jobs are only oil and energy. Tons of building permits pulled recently, but top 10 employer, but top 10 employers, not as diverse. All markets in Texas seem to be like this or have oil, energy, insurance than a Walmart supercenter. Yeah. I mean, you go where the jobs are. The challenge with an, uh, with an undiverse area is that you're far more susceptible to, to having swings. The issue is, is that, you know, when things get bad, how bad does it get there for, you know, look at some of the numbers, talk to some other investors in the area. Hey, what did it look like in 07, 08, and 09 here? You know, what did it look like then? Because we didn't have a massive vacancy issue in 07, 08, 09, and 10. We just didn't. Um, Alex Velos, ridiculous question. I doubt it. Go ahead. Uh, for less than eight doors, do you recommend Hemlane for property management software? I don't. I know there's a lot of people that like Hemlane. I just, I'm not one of them. I, I just, I think that she's an amazing CEO. I think she has a great product stack. Um, but the financials are something that I think are abysmally bad. Um, we tried the product. It's now been a year and a half. Maybe it's gotten a whole lot better, but we were on the product for six months and they just didn't do anything to improve the financials. Um, so yeah. And I think a lot of the services that they offer, quite frankly, are lazy and overpriced. Uh, there's so many different better solutions and doing it yourself and setting it up yourself to where it's something that you can rely on, where it's not just a stranger going on site because they got some call through a, an app. Um, that's all. Just, just my take on it. I, you know, the way that those are functions and features that she's added in the last maybe, or that they've added in the last year, year and a half. Um, I think it's a decent product, but we looked at five, you know, for, for me, it's, I want the enterprise functionality of door loop or app folio. I think, I think there's, um, there's other stuff that we used, but um, you know, if you're really small, I, I've uh, avails a pretty good product uh, for smaller landlords for me, it's, I don't want to ever have to move systems. And I think far too many people aren't thinking that way. If you've got eight or 10 doors, I'm going and starting off in a better product because I never want to move my data. When you go to Appfolio, when we were looking to migrate to Appfolio, they wanted something like $1,000 to convert our data. And then it was a more expensive monthly fee. It was all this other stuff. And, you know, how they charge and their structures, I, you know, we chose door loop because we thought we got all the functionality of that folio. Um, and we got, and, and, uh, and it costs us a lot less. So that's why we picked that. That's why we picked door loop. We'll do something with door loop. I'm going back and forth with them right now scheduling, but yeah, there's some people that like Hemlane. I don't love it. Is door loop different from that folio? Yes. Hemlane. Yes. Or do they do the same things? Um, generally speaking, they do the same things, but where door loop really excels is I can get a P and L instantly on any property or on my entire portfolio. I have age reports on my, on my rents. Um, I can create tickets for my handymen. I can have my tenants. It's very easy to use. So my tenants can create tickets for my handymen. And in a world where this is the new means of communication, not picking up the phone and calling somebody, that's, I think the biggest mistake is that I don't want people calling. I want people sending in a text and creating it. Literally, they can just access it via their email. Click a link. They can go in. They can enter in and create a ticket. Automatically gets assigned to maintenance. And the first one in maintenance that gets it goes and does it. And that's it. That's a far better way to run your business. And that's that's why I like. Um, all tertiary markets, I mean. Yeah, some have nice colleges as well, but seem to be way more than 30 to 40% of employers. Yeah, but college kids is a different story. Renting to a college market, that's something I actually cover separately as a whole module or module and a half in my course is college rentals. And it's because it's a different ball game. But you could really make college rentals saying, take me an hour and a half to teach it to you, but that's that's why that's in there is because it breaks everything down for how you need to rent in these college markets. Um, here in Maryland, statewide, the average is 6%, about 6.6 .6 million people for reference. Nice. Phil Neeland, what did you do this Sunday morning? Hung out with some awesome group of virtual friends talking about toilets, toilets, appliances, and strategies. Ha <laughs> ha, awesome. Thanks for the super chat, Phil. Hey, Phil, I think you have my email. I couldn't find your email. Email me your address because I have all of my stock in-house now. So send me, if you're still here, I hope you are, send me your, uh, yeah, 1246, you should be. It's only four minutes. Send me your send me your physical address so I can get that stuff to you. 
I'm ready for you. I got it. I got it all back. <laughs> so now the only problem is me, not somebody else, but I've actually gotten a bunch of shirts out in the last week. Uh, let's see. What's lowest population you would want in a market? I have one that's 2,800. Again, population is not the determining factor for me. Yep. Dylan, uh, what do you need to do uh, with insurance when closing on a property? Um, you just have to put it on a binder. You have to have a binder in order to be able to close. Uh, and then when you have it on a binder, um, that just means that you've essentially paid for it. And they're going to requisition the policy. Um, no, the bank takes care of escrows. Um. Yes, an individual. Yeah, individualized. Exactly, Chester. It's an individualized per. So it's it made doing my my cost segregations super easy. Like the way that they do it is more driven by the property than it is driven by the owner necessarily, and that's what I love. I want to see what the P and L was on that property. I want to see what all of our maintenance expenses are, and it's just a very easy thing to manage, and it's very intuitive because. I want to spend as little time in the application as I possibly need to. Excuse me. And the way that I do that is it's an easy application for my tenants to use. So here's how some places literally do it. Ring, ring. Yeah, I have a problem with my blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, what's your name? Okay. What's your unit? Okay. And they just literally go down through all the list of questions. They literally are paying somebody to sit there and enter that data in. Wrong. That is not the way to run a business. The way to run a business is in an automated fashion. That's the way I do it. My tenants, when they move in, I actually have an agent sit there with them for a half an hour, get their account set up, make sure they transfer the electric, make sure they transfer the gas, make sure that they've got an oil company on tap. And here's how you file. A, here's how you file an issue in the property management system. Let's set up your rent payment right now for next month. She sets that up right away. All of that costs me 30 bucks. It's cheap. It costs me nothing basically. But it's also easy enough where there's a problem. Hey, and if you have an emergency, here's a magnet that we stuck on your fridge. Call that phone number. If you have an emergency, you can also go into the app. You can see the phone number. You can click on the button and it will take you there. Yep. Um, let's see. Dylan, what metrics would you look to see if you want to invest in the college area? That's the whole course. It's an hour and a half long. It's There's a million different factors, but they're all there in the course. Uh, Dylan, no, I'm homeless. Uh, Going to take longer than I thought. You'll get there. You'll get there, Dylan. It takes time. It takes time. No shame in the game, man. No shame in the game. Well, I've got my students in seven minutes. So as I always say, I try and create great content for you guys. Hopefully today was useful to you. It was a huge help. Um, really start to think about your strategy. The best strategy is not just acquiring the next property. The best strategy is looking what return you get on your capital and understanding what's my next best investment. Is it something as silly as, yeah, I upgraded the three toilets in my place. Well, guess what? Toilets last a long time. So if you're looking at a two-year payback, you're probably going to get 10, 12, 15, 20 years out of your toilet, at least. You know how many toilets I pull out that are 30 or 40 years old? A lot. So Hopefully that information was helpful for you. As I always say, we try and create great content for you. Please make sure on your way out that you hit the like button and do me a favor, share this video with some people. If you have some people struggling on toilet insulation, share it with them. I'm sure that ends up being one of our shorts and how we do toilets. Hope you guys have a fantastic week and we will see you guys in the next one. Take care, everybody.